Dun, dun, dun. All right, we are recording. Cool. Audience, thanks for joining us tonight for Mentioning Dispatches. I say tonight, I mean, you can be listening to it on your morning commute, in which case, thanks for joining us whenever it is you're listening to us. We appreciate you being here. And to today's panel, this podcast panel, uh, is a bunch of folks that joined us last weekend as we are recording this about two weeks ago as you're listening to it for the second Armchair Dragoons Fall Assembly here in the Raleigh Carey, Carey area of North Carolina. Hey, Mike is back. Mike has managed to only miss one episode this season. So welcome back, Mike. I'm trying. I'm trying to get them all. We, we're gonna we're gonna see. Be like Pokemon here. And Rocky is back also because we can't keep him away this season. Hey. Evening, morning, afternoon, hello. Yeah, whenever it is you're listening. And then a new voice for podcast folks here, uh, but not a new face for those of you that hit Buckeye Game Fest, Historic AC Fest, Origins, whatever. Uh, our buddy Bill is here. Bill hit the road to come join us for the Fall Assembly. We appreciate that. Uh, so we thought we'd draft him into talking about it. So, Bill, thanks for being here. Oh, thanks for inviting me. Looking forward to it. And and as the new guy, we're going to throw this all to you first. Um, <laughs> so this, this is the only fall assembly you've made it to i mean we've only had two and you weren't at the other one so (laughs) it's easy to narrow that down but uh, general impressions thoughts uh how'd it go for you what'd you like what'd you not like let's take it in any direction you want there sure so you know i had a blast uh this size of con you know 20 30 people that that's my sweet spot uh rather than origins that uh you know seventeen thousand of my closest friends uh gamers armory is a great uh, location for it i was impressed with both the play area and the store itself Uh, they seem to run a really nice operation there and uh, they really made us feel welcome it was great to be able to spend a long weekend with uh, a lot of folks uh, that enjoy the same things i do and got in some great games here uh spent some time with mike playing rebel fury and and went on from there cool cool and it was what about a nine nine and a half hour drive for you to get here yeah yeah you know i, I live in northwest ohio so that that was about it about uh what it takes to get there well worth it though yeah and uh, I, unfortunately, it's not quite early enough for some of the leaves to be changing, um, but still not too bad coming through the mountains there. Um, but- no, you know, any later I'd worry about snow, uh, but no, it's it's a it's a fine drive. It's easy enough. I make it a, 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 all the time anyhow. My mom lives in South Carolina, so I'm used to making that drive. Yeah, of, uh, of note, Bill Bill and I probably drive very similar routes through uh, that direction when I'm going to and from Columbus. And when he's coming down this way, the the, the traffic is probably pretty similar for a good chunk of that, that drive. I'm glad you had a good time. We will dig in a little more into some of the games here in just a second. Rocky, this was your second. How, how did it go this time? How did it compare to last time? Oh, it was excellent, excellent time. Bill's exactly right. 2030 people. It was a really good sweet spot. You get to talk to a lot of folks. You get to spend time with a lot of folks. Uh, good games. Uh, not overwhelming. Um, a lot of good uh, casual uh, laid back. Let's just uh Let's just have fun and and game uh, game on. I absolutely echo Bill's comments about Gamers Armory. Uh, wonderful location, wonderful store. Uh, a lot of other businesses, if a friend of the local game stores, could learn some lessons um, from them. It's it's uh, just uh, I made it down there for Friday and Saturday, two days, uh, two days of uh, lots of good fun, uh, just lots of good camaraderie. Um, it was just an excellent time, and and I've gone, I've gone two for two, and we'll see how long we can keep that streak going. Uh, but it's been excellent. Yeah. The- the, the store definitely runs a first class operation. They are great folks. It's not just a store that happens to stock a lot of war games. The staff, at least half of them, are, are actual war gamers. Like they know what they're talking about when you ask questions about what's going on with the war game products. Never mind Scott owning the store and also being business manager for MMP and a published designer himself because he was the designer on uh, Siege of Jerusalem. Uh, Mike. Hartshorn, who's the manager that we dealt with for most of the weekend, fantastic dude, but also knows his war games very well. And so a great resource, not just for stocking the shelves, but for answering questions about what's on the shelf. Mike, talk to us, man. What'd you think? How'd it go? Yada, yada, yada. Well, again, I'll echo what Bill and Ian said about Gamers Armory. It, it, it is an awesome gaming store. You're lucky, Brant, to be near that. <laughs> it is oh, really I know. <laughs> It's 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 unusual in that you know they have the great wargaming sales section in addition to all that playing space, 
But in addition to the Gamers Armory being a nice place, uh, people who have not been to Cary, it's actually a great location where I stayed. I stayed in the same place twice now. There's a just a couple miles down the road. There's uh, three hotels right behind the Target, and it's they're all really good hotels. And you're surrounded by restaurants and shopping centers and stores and whatever you want is all right there in the area. So it's not only an awesome game store, but I think really awesome location to, to stay and attend the convention. Yeah, that, that area that we're in is right where uh, Interstate 440 and 40 connect on the west side of town and break off from there. But then also uh, U.S. Highway 1 heading south goes through some other significant burbs going to the south there. So it is, uh, it's the crossroads area of town and that's that's where several different pretty major thoroughfares all converge. As with every other connection of major thoroughfares in the United States, there's a whole bunch of commercial stuff that built up right around there. Mike mentioned several of the hotels right there. There's easily a dozen of them all in spitting distance of the store uh, without without having to go very far or like leave to go down an exit or two down the highway. Some of those hotels are often used by visiting sports teams when they're here in town, especially the collegiate sports teams that are here for events with NC State or Meredith College or some of the the consolidated events that take place in Cary because they've got a couple of national quality facilities that they'll bring folks in. Uh, The soccer stadium there has hosted both the men's and women's NCAA Final Four, for instance. So you're right, it it is convenient on many fronts for a lot of different things on that part of town. Um, and, and also, if, if you get there, you know, Thursday night for the uh, pre-kickoff event there, it's, you're, you're close to the Craft Public House as well, which is, which is also nice. Yeah. The other good thing about where we are is that it's a fairly straight shot from those hotels to Gamers Armory. It's one, maybe two turns to get there. And and that is hugely advantageous because if you go any further into Cary, good luck navigating <laughs> because the, the the road network was designed by some sort of surrealist architect that just decided to throw a bowl of spaghetti against the wall and then use that as the map for the streets. Yeah, that's what they made Google Maps for. With all of that, l- let's dig a little bit into some of the games that we played. Uh, Rocky, we'll start with you. I-, I know you were in the Take That Street game, and I know you were in the uh, Keith's World at War 85 Air game. Uh, not sure what else you played, because I was bouncing all over the place also. Uh, but start with either of those or something else completely different, and, and what did you think of the games? How'd they go? Uh, what were your thoughts and impressions on, on the ones you played in? Well, I'll start with uh, Take That Street, because uh, that was a unique opportunity uh peter brought it down it's actually a fight club international game uh war game practitioners it's not a commercially available piece it's uh intended for training with the uh uk defense forces urban street combat uh it's uh it's a uh, good to see the it, it's always fun to to play where the uh war game practitioners are and see how their take is on war gaming and war gaming design um it was just a it was a fun game we again it's uh all the game is casual. We're we're not out there to uh, you know. You're not out there to like earn points. You're not out there to try to you know overwhelm. Okay, you're always there to overwhelm your opponents. That's what you're doing. <laughs> you're playing, but uh, it it was just a lot of fun. And uh, Pete walked us through it, and uh, Peter walked us through it. We had a great time. <laughs> I think I uh, I earned the anger of some of my opponents because it's like, oh, this card. Let's see. Let's play that one. Ooh, that's an interesting effect. Wow. I didn't mean to blow up that entire building and destroy your squads, but hey, I'm just playing the card. Nothing. Nothing personal. It was, it was a good why time. Why not? Very Go ahead fun and blow time. It. Exactly. I mean, come on now. It's it's you know, if you're not blowing something up, is it really a war game? No, we won't go there. We won't talk about that. <laughs> no, it's a lot of fun. Friday night. It's also uh, I drove down. I did not make it down for Thursday. Blah. Uh, but uh, coming driving in, arrive, get there, sit down for a good evening, good gaming, a uh, good way to good way to start the weekend. Allow is lots of fun. I think uh, that was the same night, Mike. Uh, I think you were doing Rebel Fury that first night. Was that? Do I remember? That right what about what were you friday night what were you doing yeah, well rebel fury was friday afternoon i think yeah and then maybe we, that's when i got there so yeah so it was, that was that was going on yeah when you arrived actually yeah, i was doing that when you arrived yeah because you snuck in i didn't even see you walk in i was like oh there's ian <laughs> well you you had two rebel fury sessions because you also had the one on uh on saturday morning as well yeah and and both pretty full as i recall 
So, oh yeah, they were. Um, well, we had, I think we had one no show for the second session, but someone was able to. Actually, it was funny because two of the guys that played the first session came back and played in the second session. So, that's, I'm sure Mark Herman wants to hear that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, they enjoyed it. So let's let, let's jump over there and talk Rebel Fury quickly. So, I, for whatever reason, you've got two copies of the game. I'm sure Mark definitely appreciates that. <laughs> but you you were able to run two simultaneous games, and and as I recall, these were more these were primarily teaching games because i don't think you had any experienced players of the game is that correct we had a couple that that had read the rules and actually kind of poked around a little bit but yeah those i think they were all basically brand new players as far as sitting down just playing through a scenario so that's correct well hey that's cool so uh you you sort of teaching some rules getting some initial scenarios down obviously had different scenarios but well did you do different scenarios did you do the same scenario for so and that explains why i actually had two copies i I wanted to run um chickamauga for both i I had and this is the great thing about rebel fury you can play three scenarios at a time so long as you're not using the same map that it requires for certain scenarios but you can run three games simultaneously from one box but i wanted to run two sessions of chickamauga at the same time so that wasn't possible unless i got another copy and so i didn't mind picking up the other copy because one it's a good game and two it'll probably end up being a giveaway on a on a future live stream that i eventually end up doing uh so it wasn't a problem but yeah i mean i wanted to run two copies of chickamauga because i think that's a really good introductory scenario to rebel fury because it leaves Leaves out some of the more advanced, not I won't say advanced rules, but leaves out some of the rules like pontoon bridges and uh, entrenchments and, and ghost uh, divisions and things like that. So you don't have to worry about some extra stuff. You kind of focus on just the main rules of the game. But it worked out good. It did. I was I was in the very first session you ran of that, uh, and it worked out real well. I think a couple of us had played the Gettysburg, uh, which was the original game in the series that came out in <laughs> C3I two three years ago. Yeah. And but but this but this uh, Rebel Fury set it, it it's really nice. Like you said, you get plenty of game in the box, and it is an easy teach. And you know we got most of the way through the games in, in a two hour, uh, including teach. So that was pretty pretty darn slick. Hey Mike, so, if I remember correctly, you made some comment about how you had you know you had two games going, same scenario, and you had two totally different um, like outcomes coming. It was you, uh, did I recall that correctly or something? Close you mean to? as far as so we're in running those scenarios just to watch watch both tables play out. Yeah, because the way you maneuver in that game, it's possible to have two completely different outcomes in the scenario. Because you're trying to position your troops. It's kind of like someone mentioned this in one of the sessions, it's kind of like chess. And of course, we went and started researching uh, Mark and his chess background and we uh, discovered that he, yes, he... <laughs> I think, why do we figure out, Bill, that he may or may not have held some kind of rating? Chess well, he, rating? he runs the Marshall Chess, or at least at one time ran the Marshall Chess Club, which is, yeah. <laughs> if, if you're in that scene, that's a big club in New York City. Yeah. So we, we figured that he must have had some chess experience, and he had whole lots of chess experience. <laughs> But yeah, so with the way you maneuver in that game, you can have different outcomes, I think, about every time you play it, depending on who you play with, right? Yeah, what I was noticing, so I was not one of the players, but I was just watching the people play and uh, just watching you uh, over there. You you were doing the teach, you were standing aside. You weren't. You didn't have to lean in that often. I mean, the, the, the game plays well. And I mean, and that really makes it one of those really good games for a small con like that, is that yeah. you can you can sit there, you set up two games side by side. Uh, the people are playing, you're sort of, you know, hovering sort of just there in the background but you didn't actually have to do a lot because the game uh pretty much runs on its own we got people there who are interested folks like bill uh sits down interested uh and and they play with it start start exploring the system and it really becomes um you could just see the the uh yeah you could see the critical thinking going on there was a couple of some head scratching at the time it wasn't head scratching at rules it was head scratching at how do i make the how do i get this to happen the way i really need it to um, yeah the, the it was rules. A, Good, 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 good watching that. Yeah, the rules didn't get in the way at all. It was, you know, they were people were just having a good time pushing the counters around, which I think is the, the goal of the game. I think that was his design. And it, it's just, it is a very easy game to teach at a con. I kind of thought it might be. I wasn't sure. But it, of all the... And I've and Brent can tell you I've, I've GM'd a lot of games in the past, but of all the ones I've, I've GM, this is by far the easiest one to do. And even the people who had no experience with the rules um, picked it up really quick. Very easy game to learn. So I'm hearing this might be a candidate for either a potential future BGF event or maybe even Origins next summer. Well, I'm not going to say yes, but. Uh, we also were kind of analyzing it from the point of view of what if we did a double blind of this, 
because I mean, it's great that you have this maneuver, but what if there was one extra element in there, the fog of war, where you didn't have any idea of where these divisions and cores were coming in from and you had to kind of bump into them. So who knows, who knows? Bill, what do you think? Double blind, not double blind, maybe? You know, I've never tried anything double blind. I, I know I'm missing out at Origins uh, with some of the some of the events that go on there, but uh, I could see where, where Rebel Fury would absolutely fit into a double blind uh, sort of presentation. All right. Maybe uh, we can talk uh, Mark into coming to Origins and helping us set that up. <laughs> I, you know, look, we're close enough. We had, what, six different people down here from D.C. this past weekend. We're close enough. We might could get Mark to come down. I, maybe. 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 Not. Maybe not. A little bit further to drive for him. But Well, I, I mean, think we throwing out sweet... the train works to get there. So Yeah. Uh... <laughs> you're throwing some sweet armchair dragoon swag. You know? Oh, wait a minute. Yeah. yeah. Some of those brand new dice. He'll come down. <laughs> yeah. There we go. I got a couple extra dice left. I've still got the shirt. I had the one shirt there so people could see what they look like and, and decide whether or not they wanted to order one. Uh, so I've, I've still got that one. Uh, Bill, other than the Rebel Fury game, what else did you get into and what did you think? You know, how did it go? Give us a, a snippet of, of how the game went and what'd you think? Yeah. So Saturday morning, I played Maneuver Warfare, the card game okay. that's a prototype that ian of um dang it I, i've already forgotten ian's last name but brown. uh brown okay ian yeah, brown. brown it's a it was a prototype and it was the best looking prototype i've ever seen uh of a card game for sure uh but anyhow it is a modern tactical on an abstract board uh represented by cards uh being terrain and, and points of interest um and it has a really unique uh card cycling action your deck of 30 cards you have two decks of 30 cards, one of which is your resources, whether it's small units or technology or um, uh, equipment, whatnot. And then the other deck of 30 cards is really, it serves a couple of functions. One, it limits your actions because you have to spend a card out of the deck every time you want to uh, complete an action. Or if you need to do combat, you're flipping it over and looking at certain values on that card to resolve it. But uh, those 30 cards don't come back to you at the end of every turn. So you have to be able to uh, make the decision of whether or not you're going to expend your actions right now or save it for reactions to what your opponent's doing and also what you're going to be doing over the next turn or two to try to balance out that you're going to have the resources and the will to uh, make that happen. I think that's a that's a late, uh, Ian was telling me that was a late breaking addition based on some feedback he got at Origins uh, from f some folks to... Uh, Implement the decision-making model called UDA uh, that is used uh, in the in the war in the uh, actual military world. Uh, and you know, Ian, coming from a background of professional war gaming, uh, has certainly been able to tackle that and really make an interesting game. I'm looking forward to uh, picking it up when it comes out. Uh, he hopes next year from uh, the Deets Foundation. Yeah, based on what Jim told us at Gamma Expo earlier this year, the plan is to get Maneuver Warrior or Maneuver Warfare printed in 2025 so that that it, it's able to get through distro all in 2025. There were there was an outside chance they were they would try for this year but i think uh getting littoral commander baltic uh, chewed up a lot of their their energy and attention to get that through production and then also the launches of both the uh, the D-Day game that they launched back in June as well as the Chicago 68 game that they launched and wanted to tie in with the current political season those just sapped the resources from trying to push maneuver warfare a little faster in the queue. So I think that's how the that one ended up in 2025 at this point. So I, I know they've still got some some additional art that they need to do beyond what's in the play test that I, I don't know if it's a full replacement or they're just updating limited parts of the artwork, but I do know there's some art changes that Jim has said they wanted to do with the game. The impression I got from Ian is that what we saw there was just for the play test and, and the prototype. So okay, okay, that's fair. I, I like I said, I know there's still some artwork they want to do, but I didn't know how much of what. So that's good to know then. Cool. Uh, Bill, you also ended up as a GM on a game. Yeah. So, yeah. So Saturday a afternoon, game session, uh, a couple of games in it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So Saturday afternoon, we set up uh, the Battles of the American Revolution tri-pack from uh, GMT. Uh, that's another box where you can get multiple games played simultaneously just with what's in the box. So I was able to 
set up a game of Saratoga and Guilford Courthouse. Uh, we had three people sign up. So in addition to GMing, I did play a side, uh, but it worked out real well. About a half hour teach to get everybody up to speed uh, on exactly how it worked. A couple of folks had played a little bit in the series, maybe 10, 15 years ago. So it was a refresher for them, but it worked out real well. We were able to get uh, one game done in a four hour time frame, And then the other one, um, I think they uh, got started a little slower, the one I wasn't in. Uh, and they were they were wanting to figure it out a little bit on their own without having me staring over their shoulder. But uh, they figured it out and they got it done in about five and a half, six hours. So it was pretty good. Yeah, I was a little surprised that that one went as long as it did where I was I was honestly kind of expecting at a certain point them to look at the clock and go, man, we've been doing this for a while. <laughs> and, and, well, the, what was great about it is they, they realized they were going long, but they were having such a good time. They did not want to stop. So who am I to say, hey, come on. <laughs> Uh, move it along. I had nothing better to do. I enjoy evangelizing the game and, and having others uh, enjoy it and learn it. It was a good time. Uh, yeah. You know, S Scott and I, I was playing against Scott Smith and uh, he and I, um, I think we had six turns in while the others were still on turn two. So, but after that, it was pretty much even paced between the two tables. It worked out well. Yeah. And, and we didn't have anything coming on that table afterwards so they could stick around and keep going. Exactly. Exactly. Plenty of time available. So so that did work out. Uh, Mike, aside from the Rebel Fury games you GM, did you get a chance to play in anything or were you just teaching your way through stuff? No, this was this was kind of an interesting thing for me. I was kind of was in observer mode mostly this this um, fall assembly. So I really only played those. I didn't really play those two games. I watched those two. I didn't play anything now that I think about it. I actually had a really good time th this time, you know, GMing the games, of course, but also just talking to people. And uh, a lot of the guys that are local there are just, just great to talk to about whether we were talked about history or war gaming or anything, really. It was just uh, good to talk with some people. And I was trying to get a good feel. And this is the second year of this thing. So I was trying to get a good feel of how things flowed so that maybe for the third one, I'll approach it a little bit differently. Maybe it's good practice for Buckeye Game Fest. I don't know. But to try to maybe come up with a way of, of maybe... I, mean, we, I know we have our regularly scheduled events, but maybe we have um, potential pickup games, we'll call them, kind of in the wings so that we could get together once we get down there and just figure out a time to carve out playing a game. I know you brought Divine Right, and I was kind of open to play that at some point, but you know, it just doesn't happen. You get busy doing other things, so maybe a yeah. little more planning on our part. I think the, the pickup game thing ends up being a little weird uh, around any convention, never mind something like this. We always have some trouble doing it with Origin simply because we're so focused on doing things for for the wider audience, because it, it's not just an audience of ourselves, that even if we had the time for some real pickup games in there, we're pretty wiped out by the end of the day that, the, you know, we'd rather drink a beer than necessarily have to think about a game. Yeah. But something like this that's a lot more low key, where we might have some space to slip one or two pickup games in, I think depends in part on having the game with us and ready to go. I think it helps when it's either a very low complexity, easy teach or players already know the game. I think that definitely helps. Um, I did see a couple of pickup games here and there that, that actually got played. We we had a couple of guys. One of them brought uh, the Phalanx Iron Blood Snow and Mud, and they did get almost a full game of that in because uh, when I checked back with them a couple of times, they were still going and they were they were you know double digit turns in at that point. Uh, I know Kevin got out the Dawn's Early Light game that he had just purchased, but I don't know that he got anyone playing with him versus just sort of poking around at it. So yeah. I know those two happened and I know Keith at one point had, uh, he had something else on the table with him other than his three scheduled events. I just can't for the life of me remember what it was that he put out there. Blood and Fury. He got Blood and Fury out against with uh, Bruce. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. There was I knew he was doing something else, but I couldn't remember what it was. <laughs> there was also, also a pretty big, Game of Memoir 44 broke out too, as I recall. You're yeah, right. That was a big one. You're right. Yeah. The, uh, I think it was Matt had the oversized printout of that. And Aaron, he was teaching Aaron Dennis, and Aaron had never played Memoir 44 before. So that was, uh, that was a new experience for him. So we did get some pickup games on the tables. It just wasn't you and me doing it. Yeah. We were too busy running things. That's why. 
I wonder if for pickup games and, uh, and and Bill, you've seen a bunch of of conventions over the years. Mike, you've seen a bunch of them. I wonder if maybe having a small stack of three to five games out on the table, not opened up and laid out, but just kind of stacked in the corner with kind of a play me sign on them. If that wouldn't help people uh, grab a game for a pickup game where they're there, you're not dependent on, well, what do you have with you? I don't know. What do you have with you? Well, let's go buy something. And, and they're already there. Grab one of these. You can get it out. You can play with it. You can figure it out, whatever you want to do. Does that help? Does that just become table clutter? Does that kind of make people feel straight jacketed of, oh, I have to play one of these? Or, or what do you think? Bill, with your experience, what, what have you, do you think that's something that might work? Uh, you know, it's worth a try. My experience has been that pickup games, uh, it's, especially at smaller cons, are really tough. Because you have a couple different groups of attendees. You've got the locals who are prearranging things due to their weekly or monthly game groups already. And then you've got the folks who are coming in from out of town. Usually that's me that uh, want to make sure that uh, they uh, uh, have their time filled the way they want it to. So we make sure to prearrange things, uh, whether it's overtly like, you know, you had a really good uh, there on tabletop uh, dot events to get signed up for for games. Um uh, you know, some cons will have the uh, out on BGG, they'll have some self-organizing going on. Uh, the one con where I went expecting to get pickup games was uh, uh, Circle DC last year. And I think I, I misjudged uh, that both both the uh, ease of what it, what it was going to be to get a pickup game going out there, but also uh, the fact that I'm not the most outgoing person, the extrovert in the world either. So uh, <laughs> I probably could have done better making that happen. But I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of getting things scheduled, even if it's putting throwing all that stuff out onto a schedule. And if someone signs up, you know, have someone willing to play that game. And then if someone signs up, it, it fires, right? So uh, that might be an interesting way to do it is to have some preliminary games out there on the schedule that uh, someone's willing to uh, play one-on-one. Yeah. The uh, BGF is kind of a weird hybrid in there, uh, the the way you're talking about it, that there are some locals. There are a bunch of folks that come in from out of town but are there regularly enough and often enough that they're sort of quasi-local. And I think I probably fit into that bucket just because of the connections that I have with the people that live in Columbus uh, from when I did live there and how often I'm, I'm traveling there. Uh, but one of the things that I've seen with BGF that, that personally I find a little annoying is of all of the games that get played in the war room, very few of them actually make it into the official event schedule for the convention as a whole. Cause again, BGF, like we focus on the war room cause that's where all the war gaming stuff happens. But I mean, there's a couple hundred people there and there's a giant room of nothing but not war games. <laughs> Uh, al- although there will be some some war games and war game adjacent stuff in there, there's always a giant game of War of the Ring that breaks out. There's always a giant TI4 game in there somewhere. Uh, and, and you can usually find a variety of other lighter war games or or adjacent. They, because David Thompson's in town, there's usually an Undaunted game going on in there somewhere. That it would be nice if more of the war games made it into the event program so that somebody coming in was able to to really schedule those instead of just kind of standing around waiting for somebody to flag them down and say, hey, come play in this game with us. Um, yeah, that's that's probably an artifact of that war room of being the people who would show up to play Labatt for seven days and yeah. that no need to post that because they already know who's playing and, and when and all that. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, aside from the couple of games that I was signed up to GM at BGF last year, the the games that I did end up playing in just as a player, uh, the seven 1754 game, the John Company game, the True Command game. Like I wasn't signed up for any of those things because they weren't on a schedule to sign up for. The 1754 game, Russ literally grabbed me as I was walking by and go, hey, we're about to start this. You want to join us? Sure. How long are we talking about? Because, you know, I've got something else I was going to do. Um, <laughs> it, it, it worked out, but it shouldn't have to just work out, I guess. is, is... No, we need to find a better way to do that uh, it, it, for any, for all cons, right? But uh, uh, the problem is a lot of the games that we like to play don't uh, lend themselves to being a, hey, I've got 90 minutes. What am I going to do? Yeah.
Rock, do think, you? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mike. No, I was going to say, I think the other thing too is, and I, I do think, I think Bill's right. You do need some, I, I would like to see some, a little bit of coordination. If it's nothing other than a place people can go maybe to the forum or somewhere somebody can go and just say, hey, I'm thinking about bringing this game, this game, and this game, you know, does it, or is there any, anybody interested in playing it and have a little bit of pre-convention dialogue around what might be a good pickup game. And I think the other issue, though, and this this is with Gamers Armory, I think, is it would be nice if you could leave up maybe a larger game, not a monster game necessarily, but just a larger game and leave it set up the entire time so that you can just kind of get to it as you can. You know what I mean? If you have to GM something for a couple hours, then go back over to the game that set up the entire con and just get back to it and play with some other people. But that might be a little bit more difficult to do. Well, we, we tried that last year with... Yeah. Uh, with it never snows with the big market garden game and and I know I dropped into there a couple of times uh, I helped do the airdrops for the uh, for the 82nd and then I helped fight two of the battles for 30 core uh, on a couple of turns and then I did uh, get a little bit involved in some of the fighting with the British Airborne outside the city but I, you know again obviously it's it I'm the exception to the rule right because I'm I'm trying to make sure everything else is running smoothly for something like that. Um, Voss was our GM for that last year, and he was a little discouraged by the lack of people jumping into that monster game. That's one of the reasons he he had said he wasn't going to be coming back this time, uh, because he he felt like it wasn't a great use of his time to just kind of be sitting there waiting for people to come join. Yeah, I mean, it may be the size of the Fall Assembly isn't large enough to to support something like that. Well, and, and it could be that. It could be because the idea of a giant game with drop-in play as opposed to a giant game with a couple of commit- people doing it all weekend was a little new to some of the folks there uh, uh, look we Mike you and I've done origins for long enough and and you know around other conventions to know that I'm never gonna rule something out after a single year of either success or failure because there's too many other things that could be connected to why that that happened the way it did yeah so I'd definitely be willing to give it another try and see what happens um I, I think it's a good idea. Uh, um, Dick Volers, who was our uh, OSG GM, he did our, our Library of Napoleonic Battles game for us, even asked the question this weekend, you know, what about for a, a full weekend, something like this, getting a big game set up that you can really dig into and, and run 10, 11, 12 hours over the course of the weekend uh, to, to be able to take the time to get into a more complex scenario. I'm happy to do it if somebody's willing to GM it. We've got players that are interested in doing it. Like, let, let's do it. Let's see what happens. The lucky 13th season of Mentioned in Dispatches is made possible by our fantastic regimental patrons, who joined our Patreon at the top level. The Armchair Dragoons would like to thank Michael Sunberg, Andy J, Fred Stog, Joseph Knorr, Hellcat Six, Chet Bell, Staggerwing, Kevin Bertram, Patrick Garrity, Mike Quigley, oh, and Fred too. Their support of the Regiment of Strategy Gaming helps us bring you the best strategy gaming article events and this podcast. You can join us as a Patreon supporter at patreon.com slash armchair dragons. Cheers. Rocky, talk to us a little bit about the air game. The the Keith Tracton's World at War in the Air or whatever the the demo name was going to be. Uh, obviously, this is still in playtest. This is still in development. But what did you think? How did it go? What were your impressions? Yeah, you know, Keith brought along his uh, uh, air war game. Um, the, uh, the the playtest map says uh, Storm in the Gap, but the gap's crossed out and changes it to skies. It's going to be somewhere in that World at War uh, universe. Um, he uh, It uses much of the same uh, approach in the mechanics where there's um, oh, there, it has aircraft data cards, but a lot of your die rolls are just simple um, comparison uh, roll roll to the numbers. Not a not a complex CRT uh, heavy system, much like the the regular Word at War is um, not heavy on CRTs. Uh, he's still very much in the prototype playtest. Um, based on uh, the discussions, we were as, we were as much discussing his design philosophy and some of the si- decisions he was making on rules as much as we were. Playing the game um it was it turned out to be really excellent uh, for him a play test session uh he actually pulled
pulled out some markers and was marking up his uh, his map that he has there, uh, making notes. Uh, his rules are literally still in the handwritten stage, um, but uh, he did, did a good teach. And along the way, he's like, oh, you know what? That's a good note. I'll make, make a note of that, and that's going to be adjusted. That's that's the fun, and that's that's again a, a, something like that in a small con when you get that. Just the whole atmosphere is that very uh, friendly collegiate. Um, you can just sit down and and have that those those open discussions. Um, the and just the experiences back and forth. Uh, the World of War game was actually part of a whole Keith Tracton day for for me because I started off that day with his other game, his uh his own self published game of uh, Raider Drop Zone. I had seen uh, a early uh, playtest version. Um, print and play play test version of that uh it was good to see the uh the final product um i encourage people to go out and take a look at that raider drop zone from keith um it's uh Although people would maybe be tempted to look at it and say it's nothing but uh, Starship Troopers, the old Avalon Hill Starship Troopers with the serial numbers filed off, it's, it's actually much better than that. He has a, a system that he's calling shock and awe um, that he's that he's using. Uh, again, no no CRTs, just uh, look at the numbers, a couple of real simple uh, uh, die roll adjustments. Uh, the game flows fast. It flows fun. Um a little bit of some hidden information there if you're the bad guys, the Kraken. Uh, so you have your map there and the bugs popping up. Like I said, it looks, you know, it's tempting to say it's Starship Troopers, but it's actually much, much more than that. It's a very, it's a very fun and interesting system, a uh, fun to play system. And that was, that was basically my day Saturday was all my Keith Tracton day. I was uh, a Raider drop zone and then into that air warfare um, air war game. Uh, but those are the perfect sort of things for a con. I mean, I, I love going to cons and, and, and playing games, but, uh, there's something unique when you're sitting there with, uh, like, uh, table, uh, street battles, um, take that street and you sit in there. It's like, okay, this is not something that's regularly commercially available. Let's, let's, uh, you know, pull the levers, push the buttons, see what happens with it. With Keith's game, like the same thing. Hey, you know, he, this is what he wants to do. Well, let's try it and then we'll see how well it works and give him that immediate feedback right there. Um, it's just, uh, that is, that was really the, the, the sort of the, the theme of the weekend for me. It's just, it was just sit down, let's enjoy, let's talk as much as we play, uh, and just spend the time with good good people uh, who do share that common interest and uh, and make it work. And I was looking around. I saw Mike, yeah, hovering around, talking, uh, always a smile on his face. Uh, I saw the group up there with Bill. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't notice it was Bill specifically, but I mean that whole group up there, uh, Battles of American uh, Revolution. They were, they were, they were pouring over those maps. They were, they were pushing the counters. They were having fun, uh, good discussions. You know, we never. You don't get table flips in uh, events like this. Uh, you get the uh, people standing up when that die roll of, of importance comes. People will stand up. They're around the table. Other folks maybe are leaning in, watching. Uh, that's what the name of the game is in something like the Fall Assembly. And and you hit the mark, Brant. Very nice. Well, thanks. We try. Uh, without you guys as attendees, none of it happens. So that's... Uh... It's it's gratifying that folks are showing up and, and in, enjoying the games that they're playing. So, I I do want to shift direction slightly to to ask a couple of questions in a different direction, and that is uh, as as much fun as folks had. No convention is perfect. What are some things we need to to work on for the next couple of years? Uh, it sounds like figuring out a better way to do pickup games might be something that we want to look into. And so that we, we can brainstorm all kinds of ideas. I don't know that we're going to workshop them live here for the audience, but I, I will throw the call out to the audience that if you've seen good systems for pickup games in the past, let us know what you saw and what you thought. Uh, is it a dry erase board where people write down a game and a time that they're, they're, they, they're free and would want to do that? Is it putting a stack of games on a table? Is it something similar to what cabs used to do at Origins where you've got the cabs library, but when somebody had a game they wanted to play, they put a big orange traffic cone on the table and hang the box top off of it so that you you could see, hey, somebody's looking for a player and it's for that specific game. So so audience chime in, let us know what you think for pickup game suggestions. Beyond hey, Brand, let me turn that on you a little bit. Sure. Were, you know, I was so engrossed in my games, perhaps I didn't notice it, but were there people hanging around looking for for things to do? I, 
I don't know that they were necessarily looking for things to do. I think folks were having a good time with some of the conversations that they were having, but I think those conversations could have been had, uh, either just sort of hanging around tables like we did. Cause I know Mike and I were sitting there chatting for about an hour, uh, at least, uh, after lunch on Saturday, but those conversations could have also been had with a game on a table in between them. And not that we're like trying to force people to, to have to play a game. You wouldn't think you'd have to at a convention, but I think if folks are going to outside of the locals, if folks are hopping in a car and driving, whether it's 90 minutes from Winston Salem or several hours from DC or all day, like you did, <laughs> you know, you, you kind of, I, I would think you would want to show up and get more than just two games and a whole lot of conversation on the table that the conversation can happen over multiple games. And so I don't know that it's a problem, but it is something that I want to make sure we maximize the potential of, if that makes sense. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, I, I will say one of the, you know, as I mentioned before, I'm not the world's biggest extrovert. So I try to make sure that I'm playing, I've got scheduled things ready to go. And uh, I would not have jumped into maneuver warfare if I wasn't looking to fill a slot. And I'd signed up for that, you know, when it when it uh, the events were first released for signups. And I'm glad I did because you know modern is not in my wheelhouse. But boy, was it an interesting design. And it, in coming to a con like this, gives you the opportunity to really just don't worry about it. You're not playing forever. It's for a two hour, three hour uh, slot. Sign up for something that's might not be, you know, exactly what your uh, main interest is and, and learn a little bit. And I sure did. And I'm glad I did it. So I'd encourage everybody to, when you go to a con, maybe uh, look for those advanced signups and, and uh, really stretch uh, your boundaries a little bit. Yeah. Probably more than some of the other smaller conventions. We had we've barely, I mean, we haven't even quite hit 30 either last year or this year. Obviously, we'd like to grow some. I'm not trying to, you know, recreate origins or anything ridiculous like that, but but we're looking to still grow some and and probably outgrow the store here pretty soon. We probably schedule more events through the official program using tabletop.events than a lot of other conventions our size that are probably just sort of glorified game days for the locals and the friends they happen to invite from out of town. But that's that's a little intentional, partly because we're already used to doing it from all the other conventions and events that we deal with, but also because as the, the convention does grow, the scaffolding's already there to support it. And so it's it's kind of important to sort of train the audience early that this is the process that we use to to do this as we start to grow so that, that folks are kind of used to it. So, you know, we had probably three or four events that didn't fire off either from lack of people being uh, being registered for them where we, we kind of oversubscribed a little bit to formally scheduled events. I know we lost one of them where we lost the GM. He just, he, he ended up having a last minute work conflict and, and couldn't do it. But, but we do put a lot of them on the schedule kind of for the reason you were describing there, Bill. Um, yeah. You do a really good job of, uh, I don't know, what's the positive word for browbeating uh, people to be GMs. <laughs> uh, maybe one, th- one suggestion would be to also encourage folks that, you know, don't want to call what they're doing GMing and are just looking for a single opponent uh, or or two or three, depending on the game, to encourage them to put it out on the schedule as well. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, no problem with that uh, if, if folks are, are interested in doing that. Um, it, I, I'm I'm curious what what you guys think, and and so Mike, I'm gonna start with you because n- not only is this the second one you've been to, but you've also been involved in some of the planning stuff on the back end, uh, where where we put the plans together for this. Um, some things that you think we we do need to kind of work on and improve, and maybe do a little better job of as we roll forward into subsequent years here. Well, like you said, this is our second time, so we are definitely still learning. Yeah, so, you know, and we'll probably take a couple of more to get get steady on this, but. Uh, so one thing that you know, I would like to see, and this, of course, we're tied into being that we're hosted by the Gamers Armory, we are tied into their store operating hours. So where something like Origins, you know, you start early in the morning and go till late at night at the Gamers Armory, we start fairly late morning. And I guess we do go pretty late at night, but it seems like we, if we could start early morning and, and go later, we'd have more time to maybe get some of these pickup games going, you know, or, and certainly to at least get in there and set things up. Um, so I think that's one thing that I can think of. We should take a look at. Another thing is we have and the tables. It's like, what are the dimensions of one table Brant? Just not because we had them set up where you had two tables put together. Yeah. But so what? they're, they're either two and a half by six or two and a half by eight. I think those were two and a half by six. 
I've almost seen, it seems like they were like by eight, but maybe it was by six. They, they could be by eight. Um, it's a little tougher to judge with the tablecloths on them now because that that is one upgrade that Gamers Armory did themselves for their store since we were in there last year. Now all the tables had those nice blue table coverings on them that we didn't have to bring our own tablecloths and really nice chairs too. <laughs> yeah, the chairs are definitely an improvement. Um, but so, but I was you know, and we discussed this about. Uh, talking about origins too, I felt like that maybe being assigned two of those tables for one session is some games need that, but some games may not need that. So we could potentially maybe squeeze either more events or have more free space. And if you didn't go to the uh, fall assembly this year, we did have an issue where we lost, was it the two front tables or the two front? We we lost the one double table up front just because of a of an issue with uh they've got a a paint club thing that they've been trying to ramp up regularly for the past little while and they didn't want to lose the momentum of taking this particular meeting weekend away from us from them so and so this kind of led to the what i'm about what i'm talking about now is that and we we actually responded really well to it i think we we coped with it but you know we I feel like we could have, though, actually had even more table space with a little more advanced planning. Uh, I know in my case, I really did need two tables because I had two games going. I know Bill did with uh, you know the Revolution games he had going. But there were some other games. Uh, Napoleon's Last Gamble, for instance, took up one table. So the other table's sitting there empty. So, you know, we could do a little better, better planning about how to maybe put something on that table or like you said, maybe have pickup games yeah. on the ready in case someone wanted to grab one and just throw something out there. So in, in the case of that particular one, um, it, when Dick had scheduled it, he had asked for two tables to be scheduled with the, the because if he had four players end up signing up like you did for Rebel Fury or or Bill did for the uh, Battles of American Revolution, that he would have the ability to run two tables simultaneously. So that one half of that, that long table Table being empty was only because he didn't get four people signed up for it and and we happen to have it free so so yeah having some pickup games ready to go absolutely um you know had had we gotten a full set of signups that would have been free yeah and of course if we start running double blinds of these games we'll need all the table space we can get right yeah no kidding (laughs) although it'll be interesting if we if we do one of those and we pull it off Rocky, what do you think? Some some places where we could we could do some improvement and uh, and and could maybe you know level up a little bit in in one or two areas of the. Obviously, we're not trying to fix it all in one you know one cycle, but let's try and get better year to year on at least one thing. What do you think? Well, I, I think uh, th- this whole topic we can. Get- We've been talking about the pickup games is 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 there for a reason because I think I'm going to echo Bill in in a way is that sometimes uh, I didn't bring along any any games uh, I didn't if I there would have been a stack of games something there um, even something you know something maybe that uh, someone's familiar with that's hard to figure out but if there was a stack of games I mean at one point I looked up what was in the front but uh, didn't, nothing really struck my uh, at the Gamers Armory own um, T- uh, oh yeah, at their, uh, at their store game library. Right, I looked at something there and stuff, but um, I think I think having a uh, you have a whole year to 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 pulse uh potential attendees or or actual attendees, see what sort of games that there's a list of games that's in the wheelhouse, and hey, you w- will have these games available. I mean, I guess I should have asked. I mean, uh, Brief Border Wars is a great little uh, con game. Uh, Easy to easy rules. You got a couple different scenarios you can you can choose from. Um, we actually I, I played that last year. I was in some ways I was looking around because that'd be a game. If I'm going to do a pickup game, I it, I'm going to if I'm going to you know approach somebody like Bill saying, hey, there's a pickup game. You want to try this? I got to know I got to know a little bit about it. I, I to me I have to feel like I have to know a little bit about it uh, because I'm working with somebody who I don't know if they are familiar or not familiar. If I'm going to be the one that makes the makes the ask about hey you want to you want to play, I, I feel obligated that I need to uh, be able to at least do a basic teach but having a stack of games like that uh, not just a stack of games but if we've been able to pre-screen it somehow that hey these are the likely games or these are the the games that people said yeah if that's there and i got some free time but i'm willing to uh I'll, I'll, gives me affords me the opportunity to pick it up and try to do something uh, that's yeah, to, where where you can go to build on what rocky's saying too in, in addition to pick up games how about we we uh, ping some designers ahead of time and say, hey, look, here's a great play testing ground. Uh, more of you designers come hang out with us and you can probably play test whatever game you're working on with 
two for three, four uh, war gamers and get some feedback. You know, Herman did that last year and it was great. I think, you know, he, he yeah. we had a couple of sessions of running struggle for Zorn. I think it was, but yeah, if we could get some play testing done for some designers, that would be really cool. So we, we did reach out to a couple of folks that weren't able to make it for various scheduling reasons. Um, Herman wasn't able to come back cause he had a scheduling conflict, but even if he had tried to commit to it, we probably would have had to wave him off at the last minute just because the highway washed out in the mountains between him and us. <laughs> so there was no way for him to get to us. Uh, there, there are, there are actually a couple of designers amongst the locals that are working on some different projects that in some cases they've even brought to some of our monthly game days. We have one local, uh, one gentleman locally who is working on uh, an upcoming fighting formations module. So something in that GMT fighting formation series that, that he's been working on for a while now. And, and it's somewhere in the GMT pre-production queue as they, as they finalize everything to, to, to get it into production where you're finally going to see it show up on one of those newsletters. So, you know, we, we reached out to Byron Collins. He was already committed to the event in either Richmond or Williamsburg this weekend. So we weren't able to get him. Um, the folks from Flying Pig already had a schedule conflict. Uh, so there, there are some folks that are easily drivable that for whatever reason weren't able to make it. But I got no problem, you know, going back and bugging some of those folks that live in D.C. about, you know, coming on down here. I think it would help if we had a slightly bigger crowd for them to come down here, too. But but I do think that those are definitely doable things in the very near future. So I think that's something that wouldn't take long to get to. One thing that I would like to see us do a little differently going forward is, uh, and, and you guys all saw it happen on Saturday, starting between, you know, around 10, 30, 11 o'clock, once the, the four main game tables fired up, and then we started the fifth one at 11 o'clock till around 2.30, 3 o'clock, we had, we had a full crowd, full tables really jumping. Somewhere around 5 o'clock, everything really started to kind of peter out. We had some folks wander off to dinner, but then when people came came back when I mean, we were down to like three games running and and one of those was a pickup game and it really didn't stay that full that late where we were taking advantage of the full range of hours that we could have. And I know some folks, it was just a long day and they were ready to punch out. Got it. But if we'd had some things going later into the evening, maybe the people who were looking for those games show up a little later in the morning, closer to noon rather than 10. Uh, it, it just seemed that we kind of lost steam later in the day when we still had a bunch of hours available on tables that we could have had other things going. And so I think intentionally scheduling some stuff to start later in the day might have helped maintain the population there a little bit better. Yeah, I know folks still got to go grab some food and, you know, bring it back or whatever they're going to do. Uh, but but I think we could have made better use of the space later in the in the evenings there. And that's something that I happen to notice that I, I think I would want to want to focus on a little bit for next year. Um, Mike, I think you had already punched out a little earlier in the evening, so you might not have seen it as much. Bill, I'm not sure how late you were there to see what was going on. Um, no, I was one of the ones who uh, headed out, whether out it was uh, for an impromptu dinner with a, an old friend or, uh, frankly, going back to how my well of, uh, my being an introvert, my well of uh, being able to handle uh, social situations kinds of runs dry by the evening. Yeah, yeah, I understand. So, uh, it, you know, again, it's something I noticed that I, I think I would like to address. And and I get that in the case of all three of you, you still had drives to make on Sunday. Uh but the locals don't, right? I mean, we're all sleeping in our own beds. And there's those guys, we, we could probably incentivize them sticking around a little bit later by having things that they would want to play available later in the evening as well. I just mentioned the drive issue. I know all three of y'all came in from out of town, all had to get back out of town again afterwards. Uh, even though it was a federal holiday weekend, you guys all stayed. And Mike, you're retired, man. But <laughs> I, but um, you know what? My, my boss is not retired, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, what's it going to take to to get folks to stick around a little later into Sunday and at least get a Sunday morning game in before hitting the road to go home Sunday evening? Uh, is, does it take burning a vacation day on Monday when you get home? Does it take uh, a far more understanding family than most of us are blessed with? Uh, wh what's it going to take to keep the out-of-town crowd there for at least a half a day on Sunday to, to come back and enjoy some more fun that day too? I think if they're from out of town, you kind of hit on it. It's like people need to get back home, but uh, you know, and not just that, you're, you're also going to have to, if you stay, 
Sunday, you're going to have to spring for another night of hotel. So that could be an issue for some people. I don't know. Um, well, I wasn't necessarily thinking staying Sunday night, but yeah, leaving later in the day to get home. Yeah. But then you're delaying your drive. I mean, I, I had to get back Sunday. So it was just, I, I t- t- and some of those events, I think, wasn't there a, a, a GCACW event that ran five hours that day? Um, no. Uh, oh, yes. There, there was a GCACW event scheduled. I don't know that it was set for five hours. I think um, it was. I thought I they, saw it was. They didn't play for five hours. I know okay. that. And and the, the GM on that was one of our locals. Uh, but we also had the Men of Iron game that, that Dick was willing to GM that ended up not having any players in it. Uh, Bruce's NATO game had a full table. Yep. And I think that was I think that was a five hour game. Yeah. I, I Mike, that might be the one you were thinking of that was a five hour set there. It could be. I thought it was the Civil War game because I actually considered, you know, trying to make that work somehow because I having played great campaigns in the American Civil War, I kind of wanted to play through it again. So, but like I said, I couldn't stay Sunday. Yeah, for the listeners that might not have seen the event schedule, we had the original Avalon Hill Stonewall in the Valley was what was on the table there. And 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 we we had it originally planned twice with two different scenarios. Uh, Richard had set up two different scenarios depending on who what people wanted to play. So we had a couple of options there. Um, so while it felt like I left early, I, I stayed until uh, the the window for the NATO game was was closed. I know they kept playing for a bit. I don't know how much longer they they stayed uh, doing that. They they were there for quite a while. They were besides me, they were the last guys to leave. Okay, well they I, it was a blast. If I hadn't had to get on the road, I would have gladly stuck around too. Yeah, they they were <laughs> definitely there for a while. I, I mean, and maybe one thing is better planning for groups of people like maybe instead of you know you've worked you've been there all day long so you're like i just want to go get something to eat and go crash in the hotel room or whatever maybe you just take a break you know to go out with a couple of guys and have dinner somewhere and just kind of hour or two and just kind of chill and then come back and pick something up or play something i'm totally i mean i don't know i don't know how does it work at buckeye game fest because you're you're talking about people all these pickup games and mushrooming up how do they do it (laughs) what's the catalyst there I, i think in a couple of cases you just get flagged down i think there are a bunch of folks that make direct contact arrangements ahead of time where it's sort of one-to-one arrangements ahead of time. I think it does help that there's more food right there in the building because the folks that are familiar with the, the Columbus Convention Center from Origins or, or just us talking about it, the conference rooms that are used for Buckeye Game Fest are literally around the corner from the food court that's in the convention center right there. And, and not that it's great food, right? Subway is still Subway and it's still crap no matter when you get Subway, but it is right around the corner. So it's very easy to walk over there, grab a burger, grab, you know, some Indian food, whatever, and then bring it back to the room with you and sit there and play. And, and we had some fast food available to us right there near the store, but you do had to, you do have to kind of leave to get to it. One of the other things with, with Origins or BGF is you do have a bunch of restaurants right across the street there that you don't have to get in a car to get to, to go to a sit down restaurant. And that is one failing that, that that we have with the store as our location for the fall assembly is you do have to get in a car to go to a sit down meal somewhere. So uh, in, in terms of the ancillaries around the convention, uh, whether it's, you know, shopping at the store, the swap table, the dice, I don't know if any of y'all ordered a pint glass or not. Um, any of those it's other coming. things that we try to tack on around the games just as sort of conveniences for people as much as anything. Uh, Bill, what do you think? Good, bad, take it, leave it, don't make a big deal out of it, do more of it. What, what do you think? You, you know, most of that is not necessarily in my wear at wheelhouse. I'm not, uh, I'm not looking for additional t-shirts and I've got more pint glasses than I know what to do with. So I'm not maybe the the right target demographic there. But uh, I think we've established over the past week, Brant, that I'm a terrible at uh, having reading my email completely or meeting notices completely. I didn't realize there was a swap table or else I would have definitely brought some stuff uh, uh, to contribute to that. So now I know. Uh, again, like I said, I may have just missed it, but uh, I would definitely make sure people know about that because I think it's a great idea. Yeah, I think we had mentioned it in some of the emails, but probably could have done a little better with explaining to people exactly what all that that encompassed. Um uh, Rocky, what do you think? Thoughts on any of those? Uh, I, you know, I, this is a small casual con. I mean, I'm not going down for the swag. The swag's nice. Uh, I got my pint glass en route. I need to re- replenish my supply. Um, it's, you know, maybe I, I, I'm not a t-shirt sort of guy. I, this, this the swag is nice. Um, I mean, if anything, uh, maybe like a lanyard. Because, I mean, we're in the store there 
we got the little name tags, but uh, a lanyard or something. You had your uh, Buckeye uh, or so origins. You had like your, your 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 ones that you use for those. Add another ribbon for fall assembly. Um, something like that. Something that you can go from year to year or event to event from uh, to advertise not only that you were there but to to show it and you go to other events that you're part of the uh, fall assembly um that may be uh, a thought yeah it's not a bad one so start treating those ribbons like merit badges exactly i mean we're all big <laughs> boy scouts well yeah and you also need the special the the d6 like they have at origins you need a, a special d6 with a year on it for every fall assembly I think once we get to a large enough quantity of attendees that that becomes economically feasible, I'm willing to do it. You know, the, the guys at Mace do it also. So I'm, I'm willing to consider it, but it's, uh, we got to have more than the, the number of people we had there because right now the dice that are left over that we didn't give out to attendees as a part of, uh, as a part of the fall assembly, we're going to be able to reuse at, origins at bgf at something else yeah (laughs) guys we do need to wrap this up uh so we'll do once around the table here with some final thoughts mike i'll let you uh you lead off uh any wrap-up final thoughts on the fall assembly as we as we close this discussion just that it's our second one and i think it was equally successful as the first one so that's good it was a really good time and and if you're looking to get and if you listen to other um, YouTubers, we'll say like uh, somebody like Gary, and you you hear people asking, well, what's it like at these conventions? And what, what should I expect? This is a great one to attend because it's small and you get a good feel for what goes on at the larger scales. So my recommendation is if you haven't been to one of these, come to one because it's they're fun and it's uh, you'll get a feel for how conventions are. It's good practice. Bill, what do you think? Final thoughts on this. Well, I think I'll be back. And uh, if only there were a calendar on the Armchair Dagoons website that shows the dates for it for the next several years. <laughs> yeah, so. I uh, I was reloading the calendar after fixing some dates on the grid down at the at the bottom of our calendar page, and I realized that while the uh, the fall assemblies are on the actual Google Calendar to which you can subscribe, going out through twenty. 30, I think. Uh, they're not all listed in the convention only grid below. So I do need to go fix that. Uh, I was just looking at the calendars to, to block off next year. So it's all good. Yeah. And and so that if, if folks don't want to wait for me to figure out fixing that grid in there, I think it overlaps Columbus Day weekend all but one year. We are scheduled for the weekend before the North Carolina State Fair every year. And that is because once the State Fair gets here, the hotels in the area where we are, prices go up and availability goes down. So as long as we avoid State Fair weekend and go the weekend before them in October, we're we're good for reasonable hotel rooms in close proximity to where we want to continue holding this event. I don't know that we're going to be in the store the whole time, but that's uh, that's the area we want to stick with. So, uh, Rocky, over to you to close this out. What do you think? Uh, you know, this is a small uh, small event. It doesn't cost you an arm and a leg. Uh, I appreciate that the fact that it is not on the uh, competing with the state fair for traffic, for hotels, for uh, even uh, restaurant space uh, and the like. Uh, it is a great time to... To, to, to Mike's point, great time come down. Bill, uh, if there's a place you want to try to uh, break out of that uh, introvert, this is this is the safe location uh, to do it. Uh, not just for you, but for all. I mean, even like myself. I mean, hey, just grab a game, sit down and go, hey, hey I don't know you, but you're here. You're a fellow fellow war gamer. Um, and uh, and let's let's play a game. Let's uh, let's uh, let's break some dice uh, over the tables and uh, and figure it out. So it, it that's. The perfect part of it. It's a small little con. Uh, I, I love it. It's a. Uh, it is uh, a little bit of a drive for me, uh, but it's uh, close enough that it, it, we can make it work um, for the events. So let's keep it going. Uh, it will get better, um, and it's uh, it's it's not that it's in the dumps. It's already good. It'll just make it become even better. 
Yeah, uh, always room to improve, and and the goal is to continue to improve and not backslide at any point going forward. So that's that's what we're going to shoot for. Uh, one note for the audience: as you're uh, hitting the the website, also pay attention to the YouTube page. We will link them come Tuesday Newsday. But we are slowly adding some videos that we shot while we were there, where we basically stuck a camera on a little bitty tripod on the table with one of the games and just let it run for 20, 30, 40 minutes. So that you got a sense of watching the folks play the game as it was happening. Uh, it, it gives you an idea of sort of the atmosphere of the convention uh, better than we would capture trying to go live and just sort of zipping around the store. Did that once right when we first opened the, the day on Saturday. But those little gameplay videos, again, they're not really there to show you the game uh, in any formal sense, but it gives you a sense of what the gameplay looks like when you're at the fall assembly. So with all that, uh, Bill, thank you for making the time to join us, especially on your travels at the moment. Uh, Rocky, thank you for coming back and joining us again. And Mike, thank you for like taking co-hosting duty seriously. This, yeah, I'm kidding. <laughs> Glad Enough. to do it. So, uh, an audience, uh, without you, uh, we'd probably still do the podcast, but it's a lot nicer when we know there's somebody out there listening. So we definitely appreciate you being here. We'll catch you next time on another episode of Mention and Dispatches. <laughs>